propellants were considered, and by June 1937, Parsons had compiled lists and calculated the performances, assuming, as had Sanger, 100% efficiency of dozens of propellant combinations. In addition to Sanger's fuels, he listed various alcohols and saturated and unsaturated hydrocarbons, and such exotic items as lithium methoxide, decaborane, lithium hydride, and aluminum trimethyl. He listed oxygen, red fuming nitric acid, and nitrogen tetroxide as oxidizers. The next combination that the group tried then, was nitrogen tetroxide and methanol. Tests began in August 1937. But Molina, instead of working outdoors, as any sane man would have done, was so ill-advised as to conduct his tests in the mechanical engineering building, which, on the occasion of a misfire, was filled with a mixture of methanol and N. 2. O. 4. Fumes. The latter, reacting with the oxygen and the moisture in the air, cleverly converted itself to nitric acid, which settled corrosively on all the expensive machinery in the building. Molina's popularity with the establishment suffered a vertiginous drop. He and his apparatus and his accomplices were summarily thrown out of the building. And he was thereafter known as the head of the suicide squad. Pioneers are seldom appreciated. But the group continued work until July 1, 1939, when, at the instigation of General Half Arnold, the Army Air Corps sponsored a project to develop a JATO rocket unit to help heavily laden planes take off from short runways. From now on, rocket research was to be paid for by the military, and was to be classified. Galsit had lost her virginity with Molina's first explosion. Now she had lost her amateur standing. 2. Pinamunda and JPL Von Braun started work on his PhD thesis, rocket combustion processes, in November 1932. All of his experimental work was done at Kummersdorf West, an artillery range near Berlin and the Reichswehr paid the freight, and built up a rocket establishment around him. When he got his degree, in 1937, he was made the technical director of the organization, which was soon moved to Pinamunda. There the A4, better known by its propaganda name, V2 was designed and developed. Very little propellant development was involved in the A4. From the beginning, liquid oxygen was the intended oxidizer, and 70 to 30 alcohol water mixture, as had been used by the VFR, the fuel. And Helmuth Walters 80% hydrogen peroxide was used to drive the fuel pumps. The peroxide entered a decomposition chamber, where it was mixed with a small quantity of a solution of calcium permanganate in water. This catalyzed its decomposition into oxygen and superheated steam, which drove the turbines which drove the pumps which forced the oxygen and the alcohol into the main combustion chamber. The A4 was a long-range strategic weapon, not designed to be fired at a moment's notice. It was perfectly practical to set it up, and then load it with alcohol and oxygen just before firing. But the Reichswehr needed anti-aircraft rockets that were always ready to fire. When you get word from your forward observers that the bombers are on the way, you don't have time to load up a missile with liquid oxygen. What you need is a storable propellant one. Pinamunda and JPL 13. That can be loaded into the tanks beforehand and kept there until you push the button. You can't do that with oxygen, which cannot be kept liquid above 119 degrees Celsius, its critical temperature, by any pressure whatsoever. The Reichswehr was rather slow to realize the need for AA rockets. Maybe they believed Hermann Goering when he boasted, if the British ever bomb Berlin, you can call me Meyer, but when they did they found that work on storable propellants was well underway. It was, at first, concentrated at Helmuth Walters with Werke at Kiel. As has been mentioned, high-strength hydrogen peroxide, 80 to 83 percent, first became available in about 1934, and Walter had fired it as a monopropellant, 
and the Luftwaffe was immensely interested. Like General Arnold, in the US they could appreciate the fact that a JATO rocket would enable a bomber to take off with a heavier load than it could normally carry, and by February 1937, a Walter hydrogen peroxide JATO had helped a Heinkel-cated airplane to get off the ground. Later in the year, a rocket-powered airplane was flown. Again using a hydrogen peroxide motor. The Messerschmitt 163A interceptor used the same propellant. But peroxide is not only a monopropellant, it's also a pretty good oxidizer. And Walter worked out a fuel for it that he called C-Stoff. The peroxide itself was called T-Stoff. Hydrazine hydrate, N. 2. H. 4. H. 2. O ignited spontaneously when it came in contact with peroxide, Walter was probably the first propellant man to discover such a phenomenon, and C stock consisted of 30% hydrazine hydrate, 57 of methanol, and 13 of water, plus 30 mg per liter of copper as potassium cuprocyanide, to act as an ignition and combustion catalyst. The reason for the methanol and the water was the fact that hydrazine hydrate was hard to come by so hard, in fact, that by the end of the war its percentage in sea stop was down to 15. The Messerschmitt 163B interceptor used sea stop and T stop. The next organization to get into the rocket business was the Aeronautical Research Institute at Braunschweig. There, in 1937-38, Dr. Otto Lutz and Dr. Wolfgang C. Noegraf started to work on the C Stop T Stop combination. Next, BMW, Bavarian Motor Worksize, the people who make the motorcycles, were invited by the Luftwaffe to get into the act. Helmut Philipp von Sporowski, the nephew of the famous pre World War I racing driver, was in charge of the operation, and Heinz Mueller was his second. In the summer of 1939 BMW got a contract to develop a JATO unit, using the ct stock combination, and they worked with it for some months. But von Sporowski was convinced that 98% nitric acid was the better oxy. 14. Ignition. Dizzer, as well as being immensely easier to get, LG Farben guaranteed unlimited quantities, and set out to convert the brass to his point of view. From the beginning of 1940, he and Mueller worked on the nitric acid methanol combination, and in 1941 proved his point, convincingly. With a perfect 30 second run at the 3,000 pounds force thrust level, he even convinced Eugen Sanger, who was sure that oxygen was the only oxidizer worth thinking about. And in the meantime, early in 1940, he and Mueller had made an immensely important discovery that certain fuels, aniline and turpentine were the first they found, ignited spontaneously upon contact with nitric acid. Noegraf learned of this, and joined the BMW people in their search for fuels with this interesting property. His code name for nitric acid was Ignol and for his fuels Ergol, and, a fast man with a Greek root, he came up with Hypergol for the spontaneous igniters. Hypergol and its derivatives, such as the adjective hypergolic have become a permanent part not only of the German, but of the English language, and even. In spite of the efforts of Charles de Gaulle to keep the language pure, of the French as well. The discovery of hypergolicity was of major importance. Running a rocket motor is relatively easy. Shutting it down without blowing something up is harder. But starting it up without disaster is a real problem. Sometimes electrical igniters are used, sometimes pyrotechnic devices. But neither can always be trusted, and either is a nuisance, an added complication, when you already have more complications than you want. Obviously, if your combination is hypergolic, you can throw out all the ignition schemes and devices, and let the chemistry do the work. The whole business is much simpler and more reliable. But as usual, there's a catch. If your propellants flow into the chamber and ignite immediately, you're in business. But if they flow in, 
collect in a puddle, and then ignite, you have an explosion which generally demolishes the engine and its immediate surroundings. The accepted euphemism for the sequence of events is a hard start. Thus, a hypergolic combustion must be very fast, or it is worse than useless. The Germans set an upper limit of 50 milliseconds on the ignition delay that they could tolerate. Incidentally, and to keep the record straight, Zborowski named his propellants after plants. Nitric acid he called salve for sage, and his fuels tonka, after the bean from which coumarin, which smells like vanilla, is extracted. Considering the odors of the things he worked with, I can't think of more inappropriate name a cell. Pinamunda and JPL. 15. The first ignition delay tests were, to put it mildly, somewhat primitive. After a long night session, searching through old chemistry texts for substances that were violently reactive with nitric acid, Sporovsky and Mueller would soak a wiping rag with a promising candidate and spray it with nitric acid and see how quickly or if it burst into flames. And they ran into a peculiar phenomenon. An old, used wiping rag from the machine shop would sometimes ignite much faster than a new clean one soaked with the same fuel. Their chemistry laboratory furnished them with the answer. Traces of iron and copper from the shop, as the metals or as salts, catalyzed the ignition reaction. So they modified their 98% nitric acid, salve by adding to it 6% of hydrated ferric chloride, and called the new oxidizer salvike. The wiping rag technique was soon supplanted by a somewhat more sophisticated gadget with which you could drop a single drop of a candidate fuel into a thimbleful of acid and determine its hypergolic properties with less risk of setting fire to the whole shop. And for the next four years BMW on the one hand and Noegrath on the other were trying the hypergolicity of everything they could lay their hands on. At BMW, where propellant development was directed by Herman Hemaseth, more than 2,000 prospective fuels were tried. And very soon the uh, G. Farben organization at Ludwig Schaben started doing the same thing. With a deplorable lack of imagination, Farben eschewed code names at first and labeled their mixtures with code numbers like T93-4411. The fuels that the three organizations developed were many and various, but at the same time very much alike since there was a limited number of compounds which were hypergolic with nitric acid and available in any quantity. Tertiary amines, such as triethylamine were hypergolic, and aromatic amines, such as aniline, toluidine, xylidine, and methylaniline were even more so. Most of the mixtures tried. Neat fuels consisting of a single pure compound were unheard of, were based on the aniline family, frequently with the addition of triethylamine, plus, at times, things like xylene, benzene, gasoline, tetrahydrofuran, pyrocatechol, and occasionally other aliphatic amines. The BMW Tonka 250 comprised 57% of raw xylidine and 43% of triethylamine. It was used in the Tafon missile, and Tonka 500 contained toluidine, triethylamine, aniline, gasoline, benzene, and raw xylidine. Noegraph added furfuryl alcohol to Tonka 250 to get Ergol 60, which he considered the best hypergol, and reported, somewhat wistfully, that furfuryl alcohol was readily available in the United States as it was not in Germany. 16. Ignition as soon as one of the investigators found a mixture that he liked, he applied for a patent on it. Such an application would probably not even be considered under the much stricter U.S. patent laws. Not surprisingly, everybody and Hemasaf and Noegrath in particular, was soon accusing everybody else of stealing his patent. In 1946, when Heinz Mueller came to this country, he met Noegrath again, and found him still indignant, bursting out with and BMW, especially Hemasat, did swipe a lot of patents from us. Around 1942 or 1943 IG Farben shifted the emphasis of their fuel work away from the mixtures they had been working with at first, 
and which were so similar to the Tonkas and the Urgals, to a series of fuels based on the Visols, which were vinyl ethers. The vinyl ethers were very rapidly hypergolic with MSIO, a mixed acid consisting of 10% sulfuric acid and 90% nitric, and the ignition delay was less sensitive to temperature than it was with straight nitric. This had been a serious problem. A propellant pair might ignite in 50 milliseconds at room temperature, and wait around a whole second at 40 below. Also, it was believed, practically as an article of faith, that MS-10 did not corrode stainless steel. This was a delusion that lasted five years before it was punctured. A typical mixture, patented by Dr. Heller in 1943, consisted of 57.5% Visol-1, vinyl butyl ether, or Visol-6, vinyl ethyl ether, 25.8% Visol-4, divinyl butane diol ether, 15% aniline, and 1. 7% of iron pentacarbonyl or iron naphthenate. Heller had to put his iron catalyst in his fuel rather than in his oxidizer, since the latter contains sulfuric acid, and iron sulfates are insoluble in nitric acid. There were many variations on these fuels, vinyl isobutyl ether being substituted at times for the n-butyl compound. All in all, more than 200 mixtures were tried, of which less than 10 were found satisfactory. Optalin was a mixture of aniline, a visol, aromatics, sometimes amines, gasoline, and pyrocatechol. The Wasserfall SAM used a visol fuel. Several agencies tried to discover additives which, in small quantities, would make gasoline or benzene or methanol hypergolic with acid. Things like iron carbonyl and sodium selenide were more or less successful, but the success was academic at best, since the useful additives were all either too rare, too expensive, or too active to live with. But nitric acid was definitely the winner. Many German missiles were designed, at first, to use peroxide, but as the war went on, the Walter Type 17 submarines threatened to use up the whole production, and as the nitric acid work was so successful, the ship to the Pinamunda and JPL-17 ladder oxidizer for missile work was inevitable. During this period many other combinations than those actually tried were considered, and theoretical performances were calculated. These calculations were not the early naive estimates of Sanger ETAL, but considered the combustion pressure, the exhaust pressure, thermal efficiency, temperature of combustion, dissociation the whole business. Such exact calculations are outrageously tedious a single one done with a desk calculator can easily take a whole day. But Dr. Greed Range and others struggled through them, considering as fuels, alcohol, alcohol water, gasoline, diesel fuel, ammonia, prop argale alcohol, and God only knows what else, and as oxidizers, oxygen, nitric acid, N. 2. O. 4. Tetranidomethane, ozone, and of. 2. Although the laboratory men were never able to lay their hands on enough of the last to characterize it. And as early as 1943 they were thinking of using chlorine trifluoride, which before that had been nothing but a laboratory curiosity but it had recently been put into production its intended use was an incendiary agent and they calculated its performance too, with ammonia and with such oddities as a suspension of carbon in water. One calculation made at this time by Dr. Noegrath showed that if the propellants in the A4 were replaced by nitric acid and diesel fuel, the range of the missile would be increased by an appreciable percentage not because their propellants had a better performance than the oxygen-alcohol combination actually used, which they did not, but because their higher density allowed more propellant to be stuffed into the tanks. This calculation had no particular effect at that time, although the AIO, a planned successor to the A4, was to have used the new combination, but some years later, in Russia. The consequences were to be hilarious. The oxidizer that was always a might have been was tetranidomethane. It's a good oxidizer, 
with several advantages. It's storable, has a better performance than nitric acid, and has a rather high density, so you can get a lot of it in a small tank. But it melts at plus 14.10 C so that at any time other than a balmy summer day it's frozen solid. And it can explode as Esnall Peltieri had discovered, and it took out at least one German laboratory. The eutectic mixture with N. 2. O. 4. 64% TNM, 36N. 2. O. 4. Doesn't freeze above 300C, and is considerably less touchy than is straight TNM, but it was still considered dangerous, and no Agrath refused to have anything to do with it or, even to permit it in his laboratory. But the engineers kept looking at it wistfully, and when they received a, completely false, intelligence report that it was being used on a large scale in the United States, the Germans heroically started synthesis and had accumulated some a 18 ignition or 10 tons of the stuff by the end of the war. Nobody ever found any use for it. Another idea which didn't get anywhere was that of a heterogeneous fuel a suspension or slurry of a powdered metal such as aluminum in a liquid fuel such as gasoline. This had been suggested by several writers, among them Xander in Russia and Sanger in Austria, and Heinz Müller of BMW tried it out, using powdered aluminum or magnesium in diesel oil. The performance was very poor, the chamber pressure was 50 to 100 psi instead of the 300 they were shooting for due to the incomplete combustion of the metal. But the other results were spectacular. The motor was fired in a horizontal position against an inclined wall to deflect the exhaust stream upwards. But the unburned metal particles settled down and decorated all the pine trees in the vicinity with a nice, shiny, silvery coating. Very suitable for Christmas trees. The slurry idea was to emerge again 20 years later, to drive another generation of experimenters crazy. Experimentation on monopropellants which were called Monogals, continued until the end of the war. In 1937 to 1938 a good deal of work was attempted with solutions of N. 2. O or NH. 4. No. 3. In ammonia. The latter mixture, under the name of driver solution, had been known for many years. The only result of these experiments was a depressing series of explosions and demolished motors. And at Pinamunda, a Dr. Warm tried dissolving alcohol in 80% H. 2. O. 2. And then firing that in a motor. It detonated and killed him. The W.M. Schmidting firm, nevertheless, kept on experimenting with the monopropellant they called Myral. An 80 to 20 mixture of methyl nitrate and methanol very similar to the nitroglycerin methanol mixture that Krakow had tried years before. They managed to fire the material and got a fairly respectable performance, but they were plagued by explosion after explosion and were never able to make the system reliable. And there was finally the propellant combination that the BMW people and those at Arib called the Lithergals, which was really a throwback to the original hybrid motor tried by Obert during the UPA period. Peroxide or nitrous oxide, N. 2. O. Was injected into a motor in which several sticks of porous carbon were secured. Nitrous oxide can decompose exothermically into oxygen and nitrogen, as peroxide does to oxygen and steam, and can thus act as a monopropellant. But the experimenters wanted to get extra energy from the combustion of the carbon by the oxygen formed. When they surrendered to the Americans at the end of the war, they assured their Pinamunda and JPL. 19. Captors that just a little more engineering work was needed to make the system work properly. Actually some 20 years elapsed before anybody could make a hybrid work. Meanwhile, back at the ranch. The most striking thing about propellant research in the United States during the war years is how closely it paralleled that in Germany.
True, there was no American aid for it, and high-strength hydrogen peroxide was unobtainable in this country, but the other developments were closely similar. As mentioned in the first chapter, Galsit's first job for the armed forces was to produce a JATO to help the Army Air Corps get its bombers off the ground. And the Air Corps demanded a storable oxidizer they were not, repeat not, going to fool around with liquid oxygen. So the first order of business was choosing an oxidizer. Oxygen and ozone, neither of them storable, were obviously a Chlorine had insufficient energy, and Molina, Parsons, and Foreman who, with the assistance of Dr. H. R. Moody, did a survey of the subject, considered that N. 2. O. 4. Was impractical. It is difficult to say why, but the extremely poisonous nature of the beast may have had something to do with its rejection. They considered 76% perchloric acid and tetraniidomethane and finally settled on red fuming nitric acid, RFNA, con. Aiming 6 or 7% N. 2. O. 4. They tried crucible burning of various fuels with this acid gasoline, petroleum ether, kerosene, methyl and ethyl alcohol, turpentine, linseed oil, benzene, and so on, and found that the acid would support combustion. Further, they found that hydrazine hydrate and benzene were hypergolic with it, although they had never heard of the word, so acid it was. There is a highly non-prophetic statement in the final report for 1939 to 1940, Air Corps Jet Propulsion Research, Galsa JPL Report Number 3, 1940. By now Molina's group had become the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, with von Karman at the head. The only possible source of trouble connected with the acid is its corrosive nature, which can be overcome by the use of corrosion-resistant materials.